Everyone knows that newspapers don't always tell the truth, but we still believe that they somehow reflect the world as it really is. But this isn't true. Newspapers are elaborate constructions, and the journalists are the construction workers. They take millions of fragments every day and assemble them into a picture that fits into a frame that everyone recognises and understands. And that frame is designed by the powerful in our society, above all by an alliance between politicians and media barons. But sometimes the frame cracks and falls apart. The last time this happened was in 1968, and it led to the dramatic downfall of the most powerful newspaper owner in Britain, Cecil King, and it almost destroyed the Labour Party. <laughs> and out of the ruins would rise a new mogul who would begin to construct a new frame. Rupert Murdoch. And as for you, Hunky Tom. P-R-U-D-L-E. And it talks on the phone. The world's top talking power. Is, is, is Prudler a girl parrot's name? It's a boy parrot. Oh, I see. I've got it, yes. I see. Well, <laughs> well, we'll send one of our best parrot photographers, Betty. How's that? Well, it, I, I suppose you can always challenge uh, somebody's um, uh, parrot as to whether it's the, uh, the best telephone talker or not. Cecil King ran the International Publishing Corporation, which owned the Daily Mirror. It was the largest newspaper business in the world, and it controlled 40% of the newspapers in Britain. At the time this film was shot, in February 1968, King was planning to use his immense power to mount what in effect would be a coup and bring down the British government. His friends in the City of London had convinced him that the Labour government were hiding a huge financial deficit and that if they did not cut it massively, Britain faced disaster. King was going to use his power, not just to influence politics, but to take it over. He planned to create an emergency national government that would include businessmen, sympathetic politicians, and above all, himself. Cecil Harmsworth King, boss of the Daily Mirror and over 200 other publications as well. Nephew of Lord Northcliffe, the founder of the popular press. Cecil King has lived a life of wealth, success and power. The nude blonde murder, there's a man in court. On the dumped American sisters we had in the paper today, the mother is thought to be in the Cardiff area, so we may get somewhere on that. At Birmingham, we have the second day of the uh, Dr. X blackmail case with the wife giving evidence. 
And Dougie Slight's got a couple of rather nice ones. Uh, one is a wallet inside a tyre. This was a thing that had got wheel wobble. They couldn't do anything with the car, kept taking it to bits, and eventually found a Coventry person and put his wallet inside one of the wheels with £13. <laughs> But in fact, you have been a little frivolous at times, have you not? I mean, you're not, it's not a very weighty page, let's face it. Oh, yes, it is. It um, is, um, we, we, compared to other. Well, I'm looking behind me, keeping the grace and losing the wrinkles. Well, that's, that's a very, very serious, serious page. page. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, it's point. a serious it's, um, approach um, to serious wrinkles. rundown on, on you plastic can, surgery. I'm not plastic surgery, you know, cosmetic surgery. It's a compliment surgery. to a woman when you say she's not just a pretty face. Well, this is the same about our page. It can look pretty, it can be delicious visually, but it can still pack a punch in terms of what it says and what it contains. I have it on very good authority that one of the characteristics you do share with your late uncle, Lord Northcliffe, is the relentless pursuit of personal ambition. Do you agree with that? No. I very much wanted to be chairman of the Daily Mirror and strained every nerve to become chairman of the Daily Mirror, which I did 16, 16 years ago. But since then, I've just tried to develop the job I had. Well, the, uh, the phrase relentless pursuit of personal ambition comes from Mr. Hugh Cudlip, 35 years your close cooperator in his famous book, At Your Peril. Hugh Cudlip was the editor of the Daily Mirror. He was a journalist of genius because he had created a completely new kind of newspaper. In the 1950s, with Cecil King's support, Cudlip had turned the Daily Mirror into a paper that was of the people, that connected with their dreams and their fears, but also set out to change them. Both Cudlip and King were patricians, they believed that tabloid journalism could educate and transform its readers and so make Britain a better society. Cudlip's motto for the Mirror was forward with the people. In campaign after campaign, he used the Mirror to lead public opinion, not to slavishly follow it. Cudlip achieved this by finding ways of linking new ideas to how the mass of his audience already instinctively felt about the world around them. In all of this, he was supported by Cecil King, and the two men became incredibly close. Lee, um, I think we ought to just re review where we are with Miroscope. Mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, and it was... But now, opinion. Cudlip was terrified. He believed that King's attacks on the Labour government and his plans for a coup would destroy the Daily Mirror. Cudlip wrote in his diary, King's crusade against the government has reached the obsessional point of no return. And he realised that he was going to have to overthrow Cecil King and destroy the man who had been like a father to him. Saturday morning, just before nine o'clock, in Mr Harold Wilson's Glasgow Hotel Suite, after a breakfast of Finn and Haddock, poached egg, orange juice and strong tea. Mr Wilson studies gratifying front page reports of his speech in Glasgow the previous night. Only four years before, Cudlip and King's partnership had reached its highest point when they decided to back a politician who seemed to share their vision of a modern Britain. He was the new leader of the Labour Party, Harold Wilson. Cecil King decided to mobilise the immense power of the Daily Mirror to propel Wilson into power in the 1964 election. I was never a member of the Labour Party, I was never a socialist, but I was at that point, and have remained most of my time, strongly anti-conservative because I think they have not had sufficient regard for the little man at the bottom of the heap, and it was the little man at the bottom of the heap who read my paper. Mm. And I felt that we should stand up for him, see that he got better housing, that he wasn't uh, unemployed, and that sort of thing. Did you feel that the Mirror really had a decisive influence 
for instance, on any election? I would have thought we won the election for them in 1964. And the funny thing was, when they used to increase the prescription charges, double the prescription charges as they did after 59, these weren't remitted again in the pre-election handout that they used to give. Thank you very much. Quiet, please. I'm afraid your aim is no better than your material, my friend. I'm sorry, we are still in the main part of the business. This is not a commercial. It seemed to me in 1964, our propaganda was, was very, very intense and, I thought, extremely effective. <laughs> There's one basic fact. Labour has a clear majority. We have a Labour government. Labour won the election, but by a tiny margin of just five votes. It meant that Wilson now depended crucially for his survival on the support of Cecil King's newspapers. Uh, this is a sport feature for next week. It's the build-up to the, um, the League Cup final. And sport are doing a feature on Chelsea's most glamorous fan. Murdered in the church. Yes, the one the girl murdered in the church. Ah, oh, this is one. A man to appear in court today charged with the murder of cabaret artist Vicky Lane in a hotel bedroom. He's described as Frederick John Whitaker, unemployed of no fixed address. Um, this will, uh, I think we'll use this one, all right. Yes, that should be small. This is not much as I, the decision he made. Yes. The decision he had to make. We didn't have to. The decision he chose yes, to make. Okay, let's it. just try this man. No, but there's, there's a choice of words in a way now. The fatal decision he made or the vital decision he made. But it wants another word in the middle like that. Why did you say hmm. why he chose to be a guinea pig? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Well, I like the page one. Uh, it's a pity, really. He didn't do that. Yeah. You get the, yeah. the drama, the grief in that boy's eyes. It should have, could have come out, but I suppose it was space. It was yeah, but it was an idea that nobody else did. Nobody sure. else uh, touched that idea. That's good. Was all right. That's good. That's real, David Mirror. That came like from that. Scotland Yard, actually, but, they issued that. But I suppose in comparison to the front, they couldn't yeah. pull that figure. Yeah. Well, that's good. Freddie Reese having a very successful. After the 1964 election, Harold Wilson offered to reward Cecil King with a life peerage. But King refused, not because he disapproved of peerages, but because he wanted to be an earl, so he and his family would outrank the Northcliffs. Wilson refused because giving hereditary honours, he said, was against Labour Party policy. King was furious, and in his fury, he began to turn against the Labour Party. King was convinced that he was a man of destiny, and Wilson had failed to see that. Bill Deeds, who had become the editor of the Daily Telegraph, described King's growing megalomania. Cecil King summoned me to an audience, Deeds wrote. In the presence of Hugh Cudlip, he began to let fly at me on the arrogance of ministers, their failure to consult him, or indeed to appear the least interested in anything his newspapers had to say. He was convinced that ministers should benefit from his advice. King wanted to use his power, Deeds wrote, to get close to the inner ring of government decision-making. 
Like Rothermere and Beaverbrook before him, Cecil King was seeking a dangerous bargain. Too, too far. It's a bit too far away. Yep, yep. Oh, John. It's much further than I usually have for party politicals. I've got to be called, uh, John, called away I, for a phone call. you'd like to have a dry run, please. There is one question I want to deal with right away. The results of the general election show that the government have only a small majority in the House of Commons. I want to make it quite clear that this will not affect our ability to govern. And the first thing that I want to say to you tonight is that my colleagues and I pledge ourselves to do everything in our power to serve our country and our people. There is one question. Is it on? Yes, right. Sorry. Uh, we have to interrupt you, John, for a telephone call. Yes. King now decided to turn the power of his newspaper empire against the Labour government. He bombarded Cudlip with instructions to use the Daily Mirror to attack Harold Wilson. Cudlip realised that his relationship with his mentor had changed. King was becoming distant and unreachable, driven by a powerful fury. Faced with this, Wilson tried to placate King. In March of 1965, he made King a director of the Bank of England. Wilson thought that this would allow King to feel that he was at the centre of economic policy making. But in reality, Wilson had made a terrible mistake, because he had put King in bed with the deadliest of Wilson's enemies. He was the governor of the Bank of England, Lord Cromer, and he was convinced that the Labour government's economic policies were going to destroy the country, and they had to be stopped and he gave Cecil King a political focus for his disappointment with the Labour Party. What made you and the Daily Mirror, Mr King, fall out of love with Mr Wilson and the Labour government? What, what, when did you begin to get disillusioned? What turn, began to turn you against them or to lose well, faith? Uh, well, I think that so many people hoped that they would be able to deal with our economic problems more effectively than the Conservatives, when it became perfectly obvious that they were not that they were showing even less foresight than the Tories had, well then uh, one began to get uh, disillusioned and uh, apprehensive about the future. Roy, hold yes, up sir. on page one, got a new story. Um, throw out your uh, fire heroine, yeah. and in here we do 30 Labour MPs voting against the government on uh, free milk in schools. Oh yeah, we had one that... Uh it's a very well, well, well known one now, the man who came in one morning at about ten and uh, walked into the waiting room, sent for me, and said he wanted to confess to a double murder. And I said, well, um, what did you do exactly? So he said, well, I killed a young woman and I killed the boy she was with. So I said, well, how can you prove it? He said, well, I cut her flesh. So I said, how do you mean you cut her flesh? He said, well, I cut her flesh. So I said, well, how do you prove that? He said, well, I brought it with me. On the table was a, a parcel wrapped in newspaper. Uh, so I said, um, oh, what's in there? He said, well, the flesh I cut. So uh, I said, uh, well, open it. He said, um, no, I won't. I said, but you will. So I made him open it. He was sweating like mad by this time. And he opened it, and inside were the two breasts of the girl he killed. I think that's fine. And make sure it doesn't cover your face up and give you a blonde moustache or something. Your blonde beard.
And I said, why didn't you go to the police? He said, I thought I'd rather come. I've always been a middle, middle reader, he said. I'd rather come to you first. Started cleaning the arches, but they've uncovered, or they appear to have uncovered some rather interesting um, crests underneath the grime on the arches. Yeah. Sounds like it might be a job for one of the trainees. It does indeed. Uh, may involve some scrabbling about down there. Uh, yes. What about Edwina? Has she done anything like that before? She hasn't indeed, no. no. We can uh, dispatch it quite soon with the photographer on the scene. You can fix the photographer, Harry, can yes, you? Yes, Jeff Tyrus in. Is he? He's quite a good lad at climbing up scaffolds and things. Yeah. Yes. The wicker arches are being cleaned as part of the Operation Spring Clean year. If you've any problems, you'd better ring me from down there. Otherwise, can you be back in an hour with the story? Certainly. OK? I'll take that with you. Thank you. Lord Cromer had run Baring's Bank before taking over the Bank of England, and he was a deeply conservative figure. Harold Wilson was convinced that Cromer was the leader of a plot by city bankers to bring down the Labour government. Lord Cromer, from his point of view, was convinced that Wilson was leading the country to disaster because he was refusing to do anything about the huge deficit that Labour had inherited from the Conservatives. In a series of dramatic confrontations, Cromer told Wilson that he had to cut almost all his promised policies to reform and modernise the country. Otherwise, there would be an international collapse of confidence in Britain. And that would destabilise the whole global economic system, Cromer said. Wilson refused. And in private, Cromer began to talk of forming an emergency coalition government that would replace Labour and make the necessary cuts. And the man most inspired by this idea was the most recently appointed director of the bank, Cecil King. As a result, King increased the Daily Mirror's attacks on Labour to a ferocious level. And in the process, he began to break the tacit and unwritten agreement of what journalists should and shouldn't report about politicians. This came to a head when the Mirror attacked the Foreign Secretary, George Brown, for being drunk most of the time. This was something new in journalism, and Brown was outraged. May I put to you what uh, Mr. Hugh Cudlip wrote in the Daily Mirror this morning, and that, as you know, is not a... He huge... wrote it himself, did he? Uh, I understand so, but I can't uh, speak for I'm him very personally. very interested. Um, the, the Mirror article said that there were two personalities in you, Mr. Brown, the statesman, and George, whom they referred to as a clown. Now, they said that Mr. Brown should take George aside and tell him to behave like Mr. Brown. Now, what's your reaction to what they're trying to get at there? I didn't know that Mr. Cudlip wrote it. I'm very interested to know that he did. I think there are two people in me, and I think the country has to make up their minds whether they will accept me as I am, because there's not the slightest chance of me changing. May I put to you one other sentence in this Mirror article, which a lot of delegates have read and were talking about, and that's the first sentence. The trouble about Mr. George Brown, says the Daily Mirror, is not that he drinks too much, but that he shouldn't drink at all. Well, look, if you didn't drink at all, Mr. Day, you would die, wouldn't you? Everybody, every one of us has to drink something. I presume they're referring to alcohol. And you drink alcohol. Yes. Yes. And uh, Mr. Cutlip drinks alcohol. He's changed the alcohol he currently drinks. But he drinks alcohol too. Nobody would pretend that Sir Winston Churchill didn't drink alcohol. It would be absurd to pretend. But there was then an unwritten rule that you didn't say it. Now today, we are opening the whole lot up. All right, I'm not pretending that I don't drink alcohol. I work jolly hard. Power without responsibility has been the prerogative of the harlot through the ages. Are you applying this quotation now to press publishers of today, and if so, who? To anybody on whom the cat fits. 
Foreign Secretary. Thank you. Again. <laughs> I'm a rolling stone Just a lad, nearly twenty-two. Neither good or bad. Just a kid like you. Yeah, that was another guy who hadn't got there, of course. Well, we'll have this and we'll have a, um, a good full length because I like to see girls with legs on. I believe that's the way they were born. Because that's the point about news, really, isn't it? We all think of news as something definite, absolute, but there's a whole set of filters news has to get through before it reaches us. News, as it does finally reach us by press or television, may have very little to do with the really important things that have actually happened. Take to clean a coat of arms like this, Mr. Bishop. Well, on these coat of arms, we had between four and six inches of dirt and grime on the coat of arms. Abrasive blasted the whole of the coat of arms to bring it up to this standard. Are you finding any difficulty with all the traffic passing under the bridge? Well, our foreman seems to think that um, the traffic flow is much improved <laughs> by the scaffolding being erected. Do you think mean people are going by it out of interest to see what's happening? Well, I think we've had one or two visitors as well. In 1968, Cecil King's megalomania ran out of control. And such was the power of his onslaught that he began to poison and corrupt the relationship between the press, politics and the City of London. Out of it would come a paranoia that would haunt the Labour Party for decades afterwards. Labour were now governing in a state of continual economic crisis. Again and again, they had been hit by runs on the pound and had to turn to America and the IMF for loans. Where are the Americans? Have you got any money here, John Harvey? No. Can pay out, we can pay up to three and seven eight, it's damn sure. Like, Cecil King talked obsessively of a coming apocalyptic social and economic crash. And he told Cudlip that he was going to intervene personally to save Britain. King began to talk privately to Labour cabinet ministers about getting rid of Harold Wilson. And he invited them to join a national coalition government composed of businessmen and himself. Because the truth of interdependence is this, and let us get it clear. Then King without told Tony Benn of his plans. Ben immediately rang Wilson to warn him. And then Ben told The Guardian. This is footage of Cecil King and Hugh Cudlip, filmed by chance on the morning The Guardian revealed King's plans for a national government. Some of their facts are accurate, some are not. Some are untrue. It's obviously meant to be damaging. What do you think? Oh, it's clearly meant to be damaging. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. But I don't, I don't see that it is. I mean, what it says basically is that the Daily Mirror is a powerful paper and that what it says seems to matter. <laughs> that's, that's the main message. And a lot of people are afraid of it and mm. some don't like being afraid of it. Well, we can take that too. Mm. Although publicly he supported King, in private, Cudlip was in despair because King's behaviour was destroying the Daily Mirror. As Cecil King, I felt that the time had come for him to go. Because I think the time comes when people in frightfully powerful jobs, like publishers of a large number of newspapers, begin to think that they are more powerful than they should be. And I thought 
and still in retrospect believe that the time had come when Cecil was exercising power rather than endeavouring to exercise influence. And I think there's a tremendous difference between those two things. King's sense of destiny was also being fuelled by his wife Ruth. She believed that she was a psychic and had told King that he had superior powers. She persuaded him that he was so powerful he could make himself invisible as he walked down Fleet Street. At the same time, the Labour cabinet were descending into paranoia. As a result of Ben's warning, Wilson became convinced that the city bankers were using King to mount their coup. He set up a secret cabinet committee that devised an economic doomsday weapon called Plan Brutus. In the event of a crisis, the government would seize all foreign investment in Britain and all overseas securities held by the British banks. The government leaked the plan to the news of the world. The message to the City of London was simple. You try and overthrow us, we will pull the house down around all of us. of the victims by about nine o'clock last night. And from then on, we spent four hours chasing around doing the worst job in newspapers, really. Chatting, trying to find out details of people who've just been killed. But it's one of those things that in newspapers just has to be done. We're always very, very careful about, about this sort of thing. If, obviously, people are very upset when we arrive, we just apologise and say very sorry and go away. But it's, it's, it's amazing, really, the, 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 the number of people who are prepared and who are willing and sometimes want to talk to someone and tell them about the, the person who's been killed. Mortals have dreams of love's perfect scheme, but they don't realize that love will someday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have to make up something. Okay. Um, yeah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here today? Today we went shopping this morning. Well, Miss Gibraltar is supposed to have made a statement in Gibraltar before she came here about, presumably, about the situation between Spain and Gibraltar. Yes. We, as far as we're concerned, she didn't make it because we can find no evidence of her making it. <coughs> Um, the only thing we want to do is to get them both in the contest with no hard feelings. Yeah. Just stumped because Miss Spain was saying before she was going to go home unless you suddenly found 75 places for all her relatives. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a publicity stunt. Um, I don't think she would have chosen this for a publicity stunt. It's a bit strong, you know. Is it possible to speak to uh, Mr. Gorter's official chaperone rather than the Mecca chaperone? Um, and you see, not so as far, far as what we've had is the Mecca side of it. Yeah. We've not spoken to the Gibraltar well, side Well, once she's in the contest, our side of it is Gibraltar's side of it. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. In May 1968, Cecil King decided to act and bring down the Labour government. He began by inviting Lord Mountbatten to dinner. Mountbatten was at the heart of the British establishment. He was Prince Philip's uncle and a trusted confidant of the Queen. 
king told Mountbatten that there was an imminent crisis about to overwhelm Britain. He painted an apocalyptic picture. There was going to be bloodshed on the streets and the army would have to get involved. And he asked Mountbatten if he would agree to be the head of a new government that would step in to take control. Mountbatten had a friend with him called Sir Solly Zuckerman, who was the chief scientific advisor to the government. Zuckerman got up and shouted at King, this is rank treachery. He told Mountbatten to have nothing to do with it. But King was undeterred. The next day he took personal control of the Daily Mirror's front page and published an article demanding that Harold Wilson resign. It said that the government had lost all credibility, all authority. At the same time, King resigned as director of the Bank of England and announced publicly that the government had been faking the size of the deficit, that it was far higher than they were pretending. This caused complete chaos in the city, and another run on the pound began. Hugh Cudlip later wrote that King had timed all of this deliberately to bring Wilson down. King was convinced, Cudlip wrote, that in the political chaos that would materialise the moment that he had prophesied, when he would exercise direct power and save Britain. And now Cecil was dismissed, but it's so silly a word to use with so big a man. But the time had come when he was dominating affairs to such a degree that those around him, and it was everybody around him on the board, it was a unanimous decision, decided that the time had come for him to go. Hugh agreed that Cecil's reign should be terminated and then showed immense courage, if you will remember what the relationship was. And he said, now that this has been agreed, after it had been agreed with the directors, he said, now I will be in charge of the tactics, because uh, you're dealing with a very powerful person in Cecil King. Given the courage, why was it that Cecil King was told of his dismissal by the company secretary at eight o'clock one morning, and Hugh Cudlip's courage apparently sh stopped short of personally telling his old mentor and father figure that he'd been fired. I think we all have a point beyond which we cannot go. Uh, Hugh had uh, cooperated all the way along, had taken the lead, but uh, if you go back to this quasi-father-son relationship, I don't think that he could bring himself to do this face to face. Well now, you did it and you admit responsibility for it in what one paper called a particularly brutal manner. You sent the company's secretary to King's house with a letter at eight o'clock in the morning instead of meeting him face to face. Uh, that has been said as perhaps being a little cowardly, was it? Of course not. Uh, I knew King far more than anybody else on that group of newspapers at that time. I knew more about his pride than other people I also, perhaps alone at that time, because his book, where he subsequently states this himself, had not been published, had a great tendency and thoughts of suicide. Uh, when people are in a very powerful position, and like King, pretty unapproachable, lonely, aloof, and very ruthless himself, uh, I certainly feel no guilt myself about the excellent, detailed way in which his departure was planned. And now, when he said it, uh, later that it was bungled, bungled it wasn't because go he did. But in the end you got his job. Uh, in the end uh, he was unanimously sacked and I was unanimously appointed. One of Cudlip's first decisions as the new chairman of IPC was to sell one of the newspapers that was making a loss and didn't fit with his ideas of how to educate the British public. It was called The Sun. Its new owner, Rupert Murdoch, doubled its circulation in a hundred days. That kind of shot that I just was doing with Carol wouldn't get into the mirror. It, would, it may make the sun, but it won't make the mirror. This is Carol if I'm shooting her for the mirror. Can you stretch out? Far more conservative. Oh, she's still covered up. A little bit more dressy. She's just got that little bit showing. But at the same time undressed. 
They don't seem to want that. Just very, very, very simple, really. I'd be rich if I knew what made the mirror and what made the sun all the time, you know. Um, at the same time, you need something to highlight the picture. <laughs> Just, a, you know, a little subtle centre for the picture. Yeah, I think so. I think incredibly subtle. Good. Very still. Don't press, don't press your arm in. Good. Lift elbow up a little. Although they had set out to destroy each other, Cecil King, Harold Wilson and the bankers in the City of London were all part of an old story that in 1968 began to crack. What united them was a patrician vision. Cecil King had wanted to use his newspapers to educate what he called the little man. Harold Wilson had wanted to transform the British people with a vision of social progress. The bankers wanted to keep Britain great by maintaining sterling as the dominant world currency. But in a time of growing economic crisis, these stories no longer worked. They were the remnants of an old empire. Rupert Murdoch had another story. He wanted to attack the British elites and their patrician snobbery. Instead of trying to change the British people, you should serve them, he believed, and give them what they wanted. What Murdoch was waiting for was a politician who thought the same. And together, they would then create the new frame, the way we still see the world today. Well, that's a typical sign, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, one we turned down last week. Well, uh, just a dog picture. They don't seem to have anything very much. Hmm. No, it's all, uh, I never like newspapers serialising books. Because they've got nothing else to put in the paper. They're all stock pictures. Jeff! Urgent! go to hospital to, um, to see if there's a, a sort of a how I was trapped for eight hours type story. And finally we've got a stewardess who's going to glide in to open a pub from 10,000 feet. The pub is called the glider so it could just be a publicity stunt. I foresee, looking down Fleet Street coming in here, I sort of saw it as one day as a sort of main street of an abandoned mining village, you know. All this uh, concrete and glass is just so much for me, you know, really, I think.